often as we're as we're learning, whether it's in Gemara class or Halakha class, and we're going through the Halakha process, um, so students will often ask, well, who are the gedolim of today? Who are the gedolim of our community? Uh, so today we bring you one answer. Rabbi Willig, uh, if I were to recite the entire resume, it would take far too much of, of, uh, of our time here today. Rabbi Willig is a Rosh Hashiva and Rosh Kola at Yeshiva University. Um, it's Ghana based in, as the based in of America. Rav of Young Israel Riverdale. Um, and I'm just getting started. Yeah. Yesterday, I was listening to a shear online, and uh, the Magid Shear pointed out that it was the second street week that he was quoting from the Am Mordechai, uh, one of Rabbi Willig's far. Um, for those of you who will be joining me in Parsha Club, I'll tell you the vart later about Birbus Cohen. Um, without further ado, we are very, very fortunate and blessed to have Rabbi Willig join us here and share some different things. Like that. Thank you, Rabbi Besser, for your very kind introduction. Rabbi Besser's father and I are classmates going back a long, long time a school which is called an RJJ. Ever hear of RJJ? Ever heard of it? Yeah. yeah. Famous uh, Lower East Side uh, institution. And um, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, join with him and speaking to you this morning a few moments. This is not going to be a, a sheer, it's not going to be the different Torah, not from the Sefer Am Wadachai or from any other Svarim. Rather, Today's presentation is from Zez Sefer Told Us Odom, the Sefer of human life, the Sefer that each and every one of us is privileged to write and to experience as we go through life with the blessings of our Kaddish Baruch Hu, and we are duty-bound to respond to events that we behold and, when appropriate, to be mefarse mesanes, to publicize miracles, both the original sense of the word, kriyasu in, in the sense, we'll say, of miracles such as Hanukkah, which violate nature, but also miracles such as Purim, which do not violate nature. Let me therefore take you back. Today is Wednesday, Chav Ches Iyar, 2014. Let me take you back to the month of year of 1967. And I found that the best way to relate stories, even those which affect the entire people of Israel and the entire world to this day, is to speak from a personal vantage point. As a youngster, I made a decision to take a year off from my college studies, if yeshiva college, to go to learn Torah and Eretz Yisrael. A decision that changed the course of my life. And I decided to study in yeshiva called Yeshivat Karen Biyavna. Who, who has heard of Yeshivat Karen Biyavna? Now it is a very significant school. At the time, it was basically the only school of its kind. A Yeshivat Hezder. The Israeli Talmidim would serve in the army as well as study Torah when they were not in active duty. We came in Elul, in August 1966, and it was a beautiful experience. The food wasn't so great, I remember. But the, the Torah was great, the family was great, had some grandparents, and uncle and aunt there. And the whole experience of being in Eretz was wonderful. And I did spend some time in Yerushalayim where my relatives lived. I even spent some time in the Miri Yeshiva. Who's heard of the Miri Yeshiva in Yerushalayim? Now it has uh, 6,000 Talmud, and then it had a hundred or so, not much more than a hundred students. And I had a cousin who was a Talmud there. I spent time there. This is the background. Let's move forward in my family history. Family is important, as I said. My parents, a blessed memory, 
were, we'll call them to what we call today lifelong Zionists. My mother was active in, in the youth group, was called in Hashomer Hadati, it's roughly today we call B'nai Akiva. My father was active in, <coughs> professionally in something called the UJA, or whatever precursor it had. They were really very kashur, very tied to the, to the land of Israel, the people of Israel living in that land. And that's how I grew up in my home. But it's hard to believe now, with the ease of travel, till that point in their lives, they were never in Eretz Yisrael. Just to dramatize how travel has... Uh, how many of you have been in Eretz Yisrael? Is anyone here who has never been on an airplane? Never. Okay. So when I was... Let's see, how old was I? I was 19 years old. Flew to Eretz Yisrael to Karen Biafna. Before that, you're not going to lose I was never on an airplane. My first plane trip. <laughs> You're all laughing. But the world was different then. The world was different. They ask your father when his first plane trip was. I'm just curious what it will tell you. Anyway, so I go on an airplane. My parents had never been there. <coughs> then my father's parents moved to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, it's another story. We'll be able to come back to it a little later. And they wanted to see their son, their parents, see the, see the, see the, see the land that they would working for and dreaming about their whole lives. So they land Rosh Chodesh Iyar. So we're back to Iyar. Rosh Chodesh Iyar of that year. Fine, everything's fine and dandy. Now, you have to go back to the history to know that Israel in its infancy, and even going, this is now almost 20 years into its existence, is still very much influenced, it's hard to believe now, by communism. That sounds crazy. Communism? Yeah, communism. There was a communist party, and even there was a, the, the, the ruling party was socialist, it was known then as Mapai, and in the Soviet Union, there was something called the May Day Parade. Every May 1st, that's their, that was their holiday, they would, they would parade through Moscow with all their military hardware, their tanks, their planes, basically to scare off their enemies. That was the purpose of this of this demonstration. Well, guess what? Israel, after a few years, when it first it had nothing, after a few years, they got a little bit, a few tanks, they also did the same thing on Hey Iyar, Yom Atzmut. They marched their tanks with their planes through the streets of Tel Aviv to scare away their Arab enemies. Good? Wonderful. Well, that year, there was a prime minister called Levi Eshkol. Who ever heard of Levi Eshkol? Okay. And, there's an expression, at least then in, in Israel, Nichnas lo juk barosh. You know what that means? Some crazy Mishigas came into his head. He <laughs> moved the parade that year to Yerushalayim. That is an act of insanity. Why? With tanks, with planes, you have to understand, you've all been in Yerushalayim, the distance between Rechov Yafo, where the parade originated, and Arab land, a mile. A mile, that's all it is. And they're flying planes and running tanks. Okay. My uh, parents are uh, there, they say to me, okay, we, we have tickets, we're going to sit on the Chov Herzl. There was only, the whole, the whole part was two streets, the whole Yishai was two streets. Went up Yafo, made a left turn on Herzl, went up to Har Herzl, now it's Shalom, that's the end of the, with the planes overhead, so we had good tickets over there. Let me tell you a, 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 even a background. That Shabbos, it was a year like this. Yom Atzim was on a, on a Monday. Hey, ER. The Shabbos I spent in Yerushalayim with my parents and grandparents. And I went back to Yeshiva Sunday morning. And I, 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 I take that back. I'm not sure if I went back or not. But that night, it was Lelat, Yom Atzim. I said, you know, I'm not going to call the Karen Biaf to get back. I'll never get back into the city. I'll go to America Sarav. You, know, you want to get a flavor of Yom Atzvot, you go to the... the, 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 the Rav Tzihu the cook. Who heard of Rav Tzihu the cook? Who heard of Okay. But the cook, son of the famous Rav Cook, the chief rabbi, is going on and on. I'll, I'll tell you two statements that he made. The first one was directed there at me. He said, Efshar l'ch'ot al p'nei ha-bachurim mihem ha-ma'aminim u mihem ha-koifrim. That was his, 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 his dialect. 
What does that mean? If you shaved a tzvira, you were a mammon. If you didn't, you were a koifer. I was a koifer. I hadn't shaved. But now is his first thing. This thing about this whole drush has been reprinted recently. And then he said, what are we so happy about? We have Yom HaTzmut. Eifo shchem yir ha-kodesh, chevron yir ha-kodesh, bet lechem yir ha-kodesh. We thought the man was hallucinating. Hallucinating. We thought that we would never see these places. In Chodesh Nisan of that year, had been in the country six, seven months, Yadna took us on a tour, and there was a world famous tour guide, his name was Zev Vilnai, number one guide, he wrote a book on the, on the tours, took us to a place called Armon and Nativ. Who ever heard of Armon and Nativ? So the UN was there at one point, and he said, You look with binoculars under this tree and over that tree and through this wall, you can see the coastal Amarov. I think he was hallucinating. I, we couldn't say anything. We thought it's important to understand the mindset. We thought that we wouldn't see it, our children wouldn't see it, our grandchildren wouldn't see it. No Jew had been there almost for 19 years. When Mashiach comes, we'll see, we'll see it. That was our mindset. Okay. <coughs> so, this parade goes on. I'm sitting there on Monday morning with my parents and grandparents, and all of a sudden, we hear news, let me land that day, that the man named Nasser, who ever heard of Nasser? We hear the name? The leader of the Arab world of Egypt decides this is a terrible thing that's going on. We are going to close the Gulf of Aqaba, the Straits of Tehran, as a reprisal. The Jewish state had no business parading in Jerusalem, which is an Arab capital, one of the holy cities. And we're going to create a kind of a blockade. And then it got more and more strident. There was a United Nations force stationed between the Sinai and the state of Israel. He demanded that they, that they leave. And believe it or not, they left. They left. What are you there for? You're only there to protect. No, they left. And every day, the rhetoric gets worse and worse. He's threatening to drive every last Jew into the sea. They're going to destroy every last Jewish person, and then the world starts to pack. The next Shabbos, my parents came to Karim Avne as scheduled. Only problem was, every Israeli above the first year was gone. The world drafted into the army. Who was left? The Americans and the first year Israelis. Still a nice oil, but there was one problem. Luckily, luckily for us, that same year, they had dedicated the new dorm, and they had the wisdom to build a, a shelter downstairs. So then there was no shelter in Karim Yavna. But it was too far to walk or run from where the Rebbe's lived to the dorm. So they had to dig trenches, so in case Khalil would be an air raid, and they didn't have time to run to the... To the Shelter, they'd go into a trench, the safety of a trench, unless it's a direct hit, there's no shrapnel, and you can, your life is spared from Khalil, what can happen if there's a bomb. Good. There's a picture of me up into my neck in that trench, having dug out, not me myself, but with, with other, but my chaver, that was our effort, our war effort, okay? So, my parents come for Shabbos, a lot of tension. But the tension keeps mounting and mounting and mounting. Another week goes by, and it's coming to a breaking point. That Shabbat was back in Yerushalayim. The Shabbat was the uh, 17th day of the year already. My parents are scheduled to leave four days later on Chafalov. And my grandfather says to me, go home to America with your parents. I said to him, Zaidi, if you come to America, I'll go with you. Ich bin schon ein elter You know what that means? I'm already an older Jew. He was in his 80s. My life is behind me. You have to go back. I said, Zaidi, if you're not going back, I'm not going back. Finished. Okay. The next day was Lag Barmer, Sunday, like this year. And I wanted very much to go to your own. You know, in those days, it wasn't crowds like today. The government asked, canceled all the official trips, closed the site. There was too much tension. It was a cornerstone of fascists. Didn't go. My parents left on that Wednesday, as advertised. They come home to America. People tell them, what are you, crazy? Your son's in the war zone. You're in America. Why did you take him back? My father gave me one piece of advice before I left. Just don't be a hero. Don't be a hero. Don't run to the front. Stay in Karim Yavne. Whatever faith the Kodesh Baruch Hu ordains for Kalal Yisrael, for Karim Yavne, they'll be yours. And we have a faith in the Kodesh Baruch But when he came home, they said, what are you doing? So he sent me a cable. This is before the time of, of telephones. I didn't make one phone call the whole year. With a war, nothing. Not even one phone call. Letters, long aerograms. That's how it was those days. 
The cable says, should you decide you want to come to America, you need money for a plane ticket, contact my friend, his name was Letty Rosenfeld, he'll give you money to buy, that was as far as the cable went. Put the cable away, and the following mon Monday, Chavav, Monday the 26th day of the year, Israel launched a preemptive strike, flying low above the ground, knocked out the entire Egyptian Air Force on the ground, in the hangars. There was no Air Force left at all, zero. Which of course started a tremendous tank war at the Sinai, and this tank war was tremendous casualties. You know, for us, one, one casualty is tremendous. We, 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 we won the war, but we lost. Every soldier is precious. Every, you could cry over every single soldier. But it was a victorious battle. In three days, we were all the way to the Suez Canal. I think that's a monumental accomplishment militarily. No one could understand what happened, really. But here's where the, perhaps the most miraculous point of the entire war, from a political perspective, happened on that very same day of that Monday. <coughs> Israel was desperate to avoid a two or three front war. It's enough to handle the Egyptian army, which was very formidable. The Israelis intercepted a telephone call from Nasser to King Hussein. They have to understand. Nasser was saying, we're marching in Tel Aviv. We in Karabiyavna put on Israeli radio and just were playing music, nothing else. BBC, the British, picked up from the Arabs, that Nasser says he's marching in Tel Aviv. Now, if you know a little geography, to get from Gaza where they were to Tel Aviv, you have to pass right by Karabiyavna. It's not a good place to be, but we look out the window, we don't see any, any Arab troops marching. We, we don't know what to make of it. <coughs> okay. The phone says, hey, Hussein, we're marching in Tel Aviv. Come, join the, join, join the front. Let's open a second front on the, on the east. We'll share the spoils. Erd of Asik Achal and Shalom. You know, let's go. Start. Attacked it by, in Jerusalem and all along the West Bank with a very difficult border to protect. Come on, we'll go together. You have to understand who this guy King Hussein was. King Hussein was the most conservative monarch, I think, in modern times. He, he wouldn't sneeze, he wouldn't, do, he wouldn't budge, he wouldn't do anything. He thought about it a hundred times and he would just do That's the way he was, personality-wise. He was not a bold person at all. For some reason, we know the reason, lay malach and biyad Hashem. For some reason, he believed Nasser. And he decided to attack the state of Israel. Israel wrote back to the cables, stop it, we don't want to fight with you, stop. He didn't listen, he attacked, shells fell on Jerusalem, terrible. So we had no choice but to, to respond. We had now a two front war, a very scary prospect. Kodesh Baruch the Tuvo Agado, the Chasta Agado, enabled the Israeli forces to very quickly overcome the Arab forces, not without casualties, not without casualties. It was a very sad, every casualty, I get, you cry every single time. But by Tuesday morning, we didn't know what was happening in Caribbean. Listen to this, listen to this story. <coughs> Middle of Chakras, that Tuesday morning, the siren goes off. Everyone is thinking and said, ah, oh, is marching in Tel Aviv, which is passing by Caribbean. Who knows if we're going to live to tell the day, until the day is out, we don't know. We ran into the shelter, and the, the shock was there was like, like Neil and Yom Kippur plus. We didn't know. Turned out, what really happened was, one Iraqi plane strayed over Netanya, dropped one bomb, and unfortunately killed one woman. Because the woman, instead of going to the shelter, as told, decided to go on her merpeset, to see what's going on. Curiosity doesn't just kill cats, it can kill people too. Shem Yirach. Meanwhile, we didn't know. <coughs> From Haifa to Beersheba, the whole country went down because, you know, there's an air raid. And after an hour, whatever it was, they said, it's in the garden, it's nothing, come back up. Okay. Nasser still saying, we're marching in Tel Aviv and we're destroying the Israelis. And something doesn't sound right to us. By Tuesday night, it already became, this can't be true. But we didn't still know exactly what's going on. Come Wednesday morning, and all of a sudden, we hear the unbelievable news. Israeli soldiers, who had surrounded the city, old city of Jerusalem, penetrated from the east, going through the, what's called the Shahar Ayot, the Lion's Gate, into the Harabites, which you know I'm not supposed to go on, but Pikuch Nefesh, stormed it from there, 
came back down, and in short order, they're yelling out, and there's microphones, and they show the movie still to this day. I don't know if they have it here today. It's, it's a very compelling footage. Hakotel biadenu, ha ha bayit biadenu, Yerushalayim biadenu. And Rabbi Goran is there blowing his chauffeur. It, it's a scene. If you never saw it, you should see it. Somebody was arranged for the Talmidot to see that scene. It's just unbelievable. It's drama in real life. As a total aside, that picture of Sechaylim with him, you know, it's looking up, adorns the cover of a beautiful new bestseller. What's it called? I forgot. Like yeah. What's it called? Like dreamers. Black dreamer. Black dreamer. Hayyuk Chalvin. Those same people who were the dreamers who conquered the old city, now what happened in their lives? One became Gush Emunim, one became. It's a, I only read the first few pages, but it's, it's fascinating read. That's just an aside. The Kitsur. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. What you call the Six Day War was, for the most part, a three day war. In three days, we're at the Suez Canal, the Jordan River, had conquered the old Yerushalayim. It's a pella. Three day war. So, you know, the UN, of course, was, was saying nothing. They, they said nothing to help us for the three weeks of tension, nothing to, to help us the first couple of days. All of a sudden, the Jews are winning. Whoa! Emergency session, the United Nations has to come into session, come out! And they're tumbling. And they decide, we just can't go on like this. They made a ceasefire, Saturday, 6 p.m. Okay? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that we basically had one already. We're mopping up Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, and they're a ceasefire. They decided, the Israeli army, we have an opportunity, which we're never going to get again, to take out the Syrians. Syrians were chicken. They didn't do anything. But they were shooting down, as they were all for the last 20 years, shooting down from the Golan Heights, shooting down on people. They're shooting, they're always shooting down. As Rashi says, that the Elyonim have imposed, still fear in the Tachtonim. They got a Psach from Rabbi Gorin, permissible. <coughs> Friday night, they scaled the Golan Heights. Again, not without casualties. It's very hard to go up such heights. They have guns and they're on top. The Chaz de Hashem, some were able to overcome that disadvantage, got onto the Golan Heights, and they started going with the tanks. <laughs> they could have gone away to Damascus. Once they broke the first line, they started a place called, I think, Kanetra, I think it's called, whether it be, where is it, border to this very day. Ceasefire at 6 p.m. at Shabbos afternoon. Hence a six day war. The whole story is Pile Ploy Mamsh. The story is a pellet. Now let me tell you how the story continues in my personal life. As soon as the war was over, they never wanted to get to the, to the coast of Lamarabi. We hadn't been there for 19 years. The army worked overtime, 24 hours around the clock, to clear mines that had been put there in what they called no man's land. No man's land. What's no man's land? No man's land was between, not, I don't know how to say it. You know what Barclays Bank is? Barclays Bank, at the end of Rehov Yafa, that was the last place. The buses turned around, there was no, you could go <coughs> past, there was a gate. There was one place, check out what Shar Mandelbaum, on Rehov, Shifte Yisrael and Shmuel. I mean, that was the bottom day. That's as far as you could go. And I remember that I was in the, in the Yeshiva Smir, which I spent a lot of time in, my cousin learned there, and there was a, an unbelievable, there was a direct hit, a shell on the yeshiva smear, not only that, the shell landed by the baloney, by the gas, by the gas supply, that, you know, outside the house of gas, and it didn't go off. The bomb didn't, it, it didn't explode, the shell. It was a miracle. Chaim Shmulevitz, Zatzal, the famous yeshiva, so we have to say halo, and he said halo to best of his whole life, on this 27th day of year. That's the day that the shell fell, it didn't explode. The story that he told, he had notes of what he said in the Miklat. There was no Miklat. The Miklat was the kitchen of the Mir Yeshiva, on the bottom floor of the kitchen. And he said that we were saved, not in the schus of all the Tillim, we were saved in the schus of an Aguna, the Aguna, cry out to Hashem, Hashem, my husband abandoned me. He flew to another country with another woman. He abandoned me with no get. I forgive him. Please forgive us and save us. Chaim felt that's what, that's what saved him. This is a story I did not experience myself. It was not even printed in a book. I heard it from Rabbi Moshe Faskowitz from Queens, who was there. He's a relative of the Chaim and Rabbi Nochem. Rabbi Nochem was the son-in-law of the Rosh Hashiva. said Rabbi Chaim was saying to him. Rabbi Nochem was learning Gemara. All of a sudden, 
they were in the kitchen. And the, the Saal came in and said to them, listen, women and children in the back. All this Nashim Sfardiyot, Ben Yisrael, they wanted to go only to the Mir Yeshiva. We go in there for it. It's the most vulnerable place in the Shunit. We want to be with the Bnei Yeshiva. That's the Mesorah Tiyut of, 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 of the Shei, Nashim HaKadosh Shoshot Sfardiyot. They weren't so firm, observant, but they had that Mesorah. Women and children in the back, able-bodied men in the front. In front of the kitchen. Hamfaked, where's their ammunition? Your standards, your tables, and your chairs. That's how they're going to fend off the Arabs. The, the Arabs were one mile away. One mile away. Look on the geography today, you'll see. Google map. It's one mile from the border to the Miriam Shield. Probably less than that to the first part. More, but a mile away. So this story I heard, people think, that it wasn't really that scary. Come on, how scary was it really? Rab Nachum heard a little tumult at the entrance to the kitchen. Looks up from his Gemara and asks his, his cousin, Rabbi Moshe Faskos, tell me, in Yiddish, four words, the Araber Kumenshain, the Arabs are coming, he's ready to say Shema Yisrael and say Vidu, he's a man who escaped the Holocaust, he's ready to die on Kiddush Hashem because the Arabs are coming into the Mir Yeshiv. That's the nature of the fear that existed. They were shooting into the city for a day, for those, those days, they were shooting and shooting. I want to fast forward. Before I left Eretz Yisrael, I went to visit my great uncle. Uncle Luza, we called him. Rabbi Luza Freyler, who lived in a place called Kiryat Sands in Yerushalayim. That was the last neighborhood at the time. I went to visit him. I, I said, Fetal Luza. I see the whole living room wall is pockmarked with bullets. You know, the, 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 the bullets had landed. They were making holes in the wall. There's 20 holes in the wall. Where were you, Uncle Luza? I was in the Miklat. They were shooting at Jewish men, women, and children throughout the city for two days. The Kitsur. So, there's, there's, there's no man's land, they're clearing away the mines and the, and, the, and the tanks. We're opening for the public, Shavuot at dawn. Exactly one week. Today's Wednesday, next Wednesday is Shavuos. Wednesday at dawn, the cult will be open to the, to the people of Israel. So, what do we do? We do the Mishra, that's the Midik. The Mishra was in a place called Hechal Shlomo. Who ever heard of Hechal Shlomo here? I'm just curious. <coughs> Almost no, that's interesting. Who heard of Rechol King George? Who heard of Rechol King George? Oh, not everybody knows that piece of stuff. <laughs> so on Rechol King George, we had a whole Mishra. Rabbi Untaman was chief rabbi, said, I said, and Rabbi Goldberg, all of a sudden. And, and, and uh, fine. We didn't know what, the, what kind of, what would be at the Kotel. So we figured better, we better lay in here. So we dive in Shacharis, Vasekin. There was no, there was no shown kites. Vasekin was four something in the morning. We figured we'll dive we'll in Shacharis, we'll lay in, and we'll go out, we'll be the first ones there. Five something in the morning, we'll get out into the street and go to the coat. Famous last words. We come out to the street, the King George, the place is teeming with humanity. Five something in the morning. So much so that there had to be police barricades. But, you know, Mishtara, you've seen those things. Mishtara, across King George, they had, you know, every checkpoints, every hundred yards, they close it, wait for two minutes, open it for the next hundred, two hundred people to come through. And this went on all the way. Those know the geography, make a left turn down Agron, past the old American embassy, and get out of what's on your left, up to Shayafo, and you know, we never got past Barclays Bank. We were never going to, all of a sudden, it's open. <laughs> you have to understand, I was a movie star. And he got caught. Yeah, he didn't put that on my resume. <coughs> a movie star. Someone made a movie called Survival 67. I would never have seen it, but someone said, you're in the movie, you gotta go see it. So I had to sit through two hours to see myself for two seconds. Okay. You saw the movie. Probably you can dig it out in the archive somewhere. But there were people dancing in the streets of Yerushalayim, shoulder to shoulder, all kinds of Jews. I remember distinctly, I was dancing myself. There was a, a Rab Ara Lechosin, who was Yantif, wearing his yellow uh, kapota with his strimal, Yantif, with his long white socks. On the other side, there was a not yet observant Jew with no yarmulke, with a camera slung over his shoulder. And everyone's dancing, literally holding, holding on, shoulder to shoulder, dancing down until they stop again. The leader of the dance for us, with Karim Yad, the boys, was a man named Rabbi Shaya Hadari Shalita. Rabbi Hadari was, this is, now he printed this, he gave me a copy of it. When he was a youngster, he said, it was, I think if I'm told, it was, it was called, they had a, a pseudo hakel, that must have been in Tov Shin Vov. He must have been a really, a bar mitzvah boy. 
he heard a lilting Sephardi tune in the old city of Shalayim. Samachti ba'omrim li beis Hashem nelech. Om do sir agleni b'sharaki b'shalayim. B'shalayim ha'beniyaki yeshechub alayachtav. Three consecutive sukkah b'til kuf ha'bet. And he remembered that tune. That, and now he's, he's, re- he's reliving it. He's teaching it. It's like a Sephardi tune. Is, and we're all singing and dancing this tune. <laughs> we finally come down. Go to the Shariafo. And you go to the right. Same way you go now. And you go down to the left, down the hill, all of a sudden, right in front of your eyes. Fortunately, Tzal had the foresight in those few days to completely bomb and destroy all the houses that were what's, what's now Rachvat Akotu. Had they waited a week, it never would have happened. You would have said, this is Arab houses, boom, bombed the whole thing out. Of course, they didn't have a chance to do anything, it was just dirt. Dirt, dirt, and more dirt. And crowds, crowds, and more crowds. Who ever heard of the New York Times here? <laughs> Are they our friends? No. 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 Never were. They wrote that 250,000 Jews were at the coastal of Rabbi that day. Let me tell you one more. They always underestimate it. You know? So we come, and we're davening Musaf. I want to remember what it says in Musaf and Shalosh Regal. What it says? What's it all? What's the whole theme of Musaf? On, Shal- on, on the Yom Tov. What's, what's it all about? What's, what's it about? It's all about the whole, you'll open up, you'll see next week. It's all about coming to Yerushalayim. And here we are, believe it or not, we thought we wouldn't see it, and our children wouldn't see it, and our grandchildren wouldn't see it, and here we are. That Musaf is a, he, he, the whole scene is an unforgettable scene. Unforgettable. No, nope, but we had to get out, because it's traffic control. You could sit there all day. <laughs> the nice thing they say, you know, how do you get out? They come, go out to the shuk. You don't you ever dare walk in that shuk, especially later. It's a chas for to walk in that shuk now. When we walked in that shuk then, the Arabs were literally cowering. But, but, but I mean cowering. They were mumbish, scared, scared of me. When <laughs> they scared of an American boy. They, they were just scared of every, every you walk by. They seemed to be so scared, petrified. Kodesh Baruch put the fear of heaven in their hearts. We don't understand how it happened. Then we, of course, went on trips to, to Shechem, Irak Kodesh, and Chevron, Irak Kodesh, to the Fishy Ruts, in both of those cities, and they're scared of us. It's an unbelievable thing. After the war was over, many, many people said Hallel, or other Pirkei Tehillim, or other demonstrations of Shevach Vodot HaKadosh Baruch, which is the way it should be. The next year, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim gave a psak, which I don't fully understand. And although on Yom Atzmut, they recommend you say halal without a bracha, Yom Yerushalayim with a bracha. I'm not getting into the intricacies of the halachic process right now. In our shul this morning, we follow the more... Uh, I'll call it the main, mainstream approach. We said halal after davening, full halal, without a brach. I'm just going to quote you, in conclusion, a very brief excerpt from an article I brought with me. The article is written by a, 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 a goyen and tzaddik that most of you probably never heard of, Harav Saraya Dablitsky. In one person in the room knows who he is. A Goyen, a Makubal, he's 90 something years old, lives in, <coughs> lives in B'nai Brak, been there for most of his life. His son is already a Tamat Chacham Mufluk. Give me a couple of minutes over time. I don't want to go over the, over the few minutes, okay? <coughs> okay, I don't want to go over the time, it's not nice, but just a few minutes. Give me a few minutes. He says, in Jewish history, there were many holidays in particular communities which are known as Purim. Purim Kata. Purim, he gives an example, Purim Frankfurt. Purim Frankfurt, what happened? It was a, it was a room, a chashash, that the Goyim were going to make a pogrom on a certain day, the 9th of Adar. The day passed, there was no pogrom, and they made a holiday that the Chassam Sov, who was born there, kept, even when he lived later in Presburg. And he was born more than 100 years after this story. Says Rav Dablitsky, if you will look at the events that transpired 
to, which trigger these perms in these particular towns, I will not exaggerate if I say that compared to the Nisim, which happened in, our, in Eretz Yisrael last year, he's running a year later, they are, catch this pun, they are a Purim spiel compared to them. What do you mean? What happened? <laughs> Nothing ever happens. It's an imagined threat. And here what happened? What happened over here? He tells us what happened over here. The Maorot v'Nisim Shekarlano last year. Everyone knows Hebrew here? A little bit? Hebrew? Achresh et Sarareinu Imui Begalui Kaval Kol HaOlam Kulo Valgalei HaAtar Bahashmota Totalit Ad HaYudi HaKharon Uvesof Hufsu Toch Kami Amim Achrei HaKhanot Shachu Ulai Kesrim Shana Liyom Zeh Shekivu Lo They wanted to kill us all. And let me tell you one incident. When the Israeli army in 67 overran Latrun, you know Ever Latrun? It was a yeah. fort yeah. still there. They fought blood over it in 48. At the end of that, in the Arabs' hand, there was no time for the Arabs to shred their papers. <laughs> they ran away. They discovered, they put it on the front page of Mariv in Arabic with the Hebrew translation. Those who know, Latrun is right near a place called Shalavim. Who's ever heard of Shalavim? Yeshiva Shalavim? Okay, so before 67, Shalavim was in a little jut out. That's it. A kilometer or two this way, surrounded on three sides by Arabs. You can only access Israel from the west. They discovered a diabolical plan. They're going to take tanks, cut off Shalavim, so all they have to go is two kilometers, cut the place off, and destroy it. It's in the plant. Every man, woman, and child. This is Hamel. This is Hitler. Every man, woman, and child. That I saw my own eyes. He doesn't understand the Blitzky. How come the rabbis aren't saying anything? Sure, there were people who didn't shul on their own. Except for the chief rabbi, no one says everything. So they said, okay. There was so hamum. A year later, for sure. What happened? The chief rabbi said to say, hello. I read in Hebrew. It's such a sad thing. Because those are powerful words. <coughs> sure, people on their own did things. It's absurd, he says. Rakla absurd. Kimat mizazea yotem meshem atzik. Shmirat chare diyuto virat nashamayim shal adam shal tamid nikbaa bene hamon. Ayadei ribut filot, brachot, tilim. Nimdida eshtaken vishanazu. Back with mirror. Over the mamash. So many Balit Shuvas were created in the Six Day War, and nothing, nothing. Two weeks ago, he says, Rabbi Simchut starts came to tell us what we're not allowed to say. They forgot about all the purps? They lost their minds? What are you doing? What do you need, he says? He's right in 1968. <laughs> to get to some date. You want to do Bet Sivan, Rosh Chodesh Sivan. That doesn't make a difference. Whenever you want, don't say Tachnan. This is Rav Dabliski. He's living in B'nai Barak. A card carrying Haredi leader is suggesting no tachnun. Amirat halel shalem belib racha achad shulav amash. That's what he suggests. No problem. Sphere the whole discussion. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the fact that 
there is no tzlil haba'at sheva kotoda he begedem mishge chamumo. That's how he ends. It's a serious mistake, which unfortunately prevails to this day. I'm, today I'm making the rounds to a number of different places where I was